Hello, Mike Dudley here from the Virginia Asphalt Association. And this presentation is going to be on preparing specimens for BMD testing. And we're going to talk about both kinds of specimens. Your mixed design specimens, which is lab produced, and your production specimens during this presentation. Let's start out talking about your mixed design specimens. As you can see by this table, there's a whole lot of specimens required. Um, we haven't changed anything on the volumetric side. All that stayed. So we need the 12 gyratory pills that was required to do a uh, mixed design. But in addition to those, we've added in the IDT and the APA specimens. Uh, the IDT is your cracking test, and you need 15 that are, that are done with what we call short-term aging, and then there's an additional five that gets long-term aging. We'll talk more about this as we go through the presentation. Your APA is going to require a minimum of eight specimens which is for the rut testing. In addition to all these specimens, which happens to be 40 specimens, you also need to think that during part B of your mix design, which is your second part of your mix design approval, you've got to do a minimum of six TSR specimens to get that approved. So we're looking at 46 specimens to get a uh, BMD mix design approved. The lab mixing procedures, whether you're making BMD or performance test specimens or you're making volumetrics, hasn't changed. You still follow ASHTO T312 on how you prepare the specimens. Uh, for the uh, performance specimens, it is recommended during the mix, mixing procedure that we prepare these specimens individually. You're going to hear me talk about some variability in the testing. And the last thing we need during the mix design phase is add variability when we're just batching and mixing our specimens because we're going to split them out. So we recommend these to be done individually. Um, to do this, you do have to adjust your batch weights to meet your specified target uh, voids that we'll be discussing later. Uh, Ashto R30 talks about the conditioning for these specimens. We're going to talk about how that can change on certain individual specimens as we go through. Let's start with the uh, batch lab specimens. All right, uh, batching and mixing the BMD specimen follows the same process as we discussed if it was a volumetric specimen. And the important part of when you're batching and mixing, you want to simulate as best you can what, what is your mix is going to do during production. So you want to batch your aggregates individually. Uh, and then when it comes, as you can see in this, this picture here, we're, we're separating our individual aggregates. In case we add too much, we'll be able to remove a little bit without removing the wrong material. And um, it's also recommended when I put this aggregate in the oven for mixing that I want to add this aggregate to the, to the hottest oven I got as far as mixing temperature wise goes because I need, and what's typically recommended is 50 degrees above your binder mix temperature. When we're batching our wrap, we want to keep it in a separate pan. Because um, wrap, you can't put it in overnight. You can't put it in for a long period of time. Wrap can only be in your oven 30 minutes prior to mixing. You can tell from these, these images here, we batched our wrap separately. We kept it in a separate pan. When it comes time to add it to the oven, we pulled our aggregate out and we've, we've added it to the aggregate and we've stirred it in so that heat transfer begins right away. When it's finally, everything's up to temperature and we're ready to mix, we want to place the aggregate with the wrap and the binder in a mixing bucket. One important thing to note here, when you're mixing your performance or BMD specimens, it's important that any additive you may be using be included in this binder. Past volumetrics, it really didn't make a whole lot of difference whether you had an anastrip in there because you was going to do your TSR to, to test your anastrip. Well, with these performance tests, we found that certain additives can influence these tests a little bit. So we want to make sure all the additives, whether you're adding a, a, uh, a anastrip or even a warm mix additive, be included in your binder when you're mixing your performance test specimens. Once your specimens are mixed, we want to condition them. And part of ASHTO R30 explains how this is done. Uh, you want to condition them in a pan, and there's actually a specimen, uh, a thick layer thickness required when you're actually conditioning these specimens. It's between 25 and 50 millimeters, which is one to two inches. 
So you need a certain size specimen, and let's say a typical volumetric pill, just by for simple numbers, is 5,000 grams. You can see the size pan, uh, pan you would need to put 5,000 grams in. But when I'm going to do my IDTCT, which is going to be only half that weight, approximately 2,500 grams, I can't put that same quantity in the larger pan and maintain the one to two inch thickness. So I need a smaller pan size for my IDTCT specimens. It's very important when we're conditioning or aging, whichever words you prefer, our specimens that during the mix design process, they be done individually. We cannot, if, if we elected to possibly add variability and, and mix more than one specimen at a time that we're going to split down, we have to split them down immediately following mixing. It's very important because they have to have their conditioning done individually and in individual pans. Uh, something else I want to point out from this, this uh, picture of this oven here is notice the sides of the oven are perforated. This is what's considered a horizontal flow oven and it maintains the temperature much better than what we, we can have a direct, uh, direct air flow oven which is just blowing air straight down or straight up. This actually blows it in a circular format through these perforated sides. So this is very important to help improve the accuracy of our testing. Now let's talk about some of the testing and what has to be done specifically for a test. Let's talk about the IDTCT, which is the crack test that Virginia has elected to use for BMD testing. And to do this, uh, first thing you got to know is we're going to need a lot of specimens. Uh, the test requires a minimum of five specimens per test. So if you don't have, you have to have five and average the test results to make sure you have one IDT, CT, or CT index is also called value to report for this mix. So to do, for, the, for during the design process, we're required to pr provide a CT index result or a, a IDT, CT test result at design binder content at 0.5% above and at 0.5% of below. As I stated earlier, that's a minimum of 15 specimens. And I will say when you're making these specimens, you might want to make a few extras so you don't have to come back later and make this one or two that are off add-ins. Um, so I typically I would recommend doing seven specimens at each, at each one of these asphalt contents. Uh, the specimen size is 150 millimeters and they're 62 millimeters tall. A little note here that we can compact to the specimen height and we'll talk more about that later. Uh, the air void range, which is why you may have to discard a specimen if you're outside of range, is 7 plus or minus 0.5% air voids. So if you're outside that 0.5 uh, plus or minus 0.5, you have to discard the specimen and make a new one. When it comes to aging, what we call short-term conditioning, you condition this loose mix for four hours at compaction temperature before compacting. It's, it's important during this four hours of conditioning that you stir the mix at six, 60 minute intervals. We mentioned earlier there's one set of pills that for the IDTCT crack test that need to be long term aged. Let's talk about that. Just like before with the short term age pills or your, your CT index pills, it takes a minimum of five specimens to obtain one average value that you would report as your CT index value for your long-term age specimens. And these five specimens have to be done at your design binder content. For this to happen, you want to condition a loose mixture for eight hours at 135C or 275 degrees Fahrenheit, which has to occur after your short-term conditioning. So let's talk about this for just a second. I batched and mix my specimen in the morning and then I need to do the short-term condition, which we now know was four hours. So I can do that in one day's time, okay? And that four hours would have been at normal compaction temperature. At the end of that day's time, I need to allow these specimens to cool down and just let them cool, take them out of the oven. Don't leave them in the oven. You don't want this to be a slow cool process. You want to, you want to take them out of the oven so they cool down. Come in the next morning and I need to do the eight hours of long-term aging at 275 degrees Fahrenheit. 
So I want to get my oven up to 275 degrees and I want to load each one of these pans in, in, in the oven. One thing I forgot to mention, there's an additional requirement as to how the specimen is handled during the long-term aging. During the long-term aging, the, the specimen thickness is no longer an inch to two inches like it was for short-term aging. It is with a maximum nominal aggregate size. So if I'm doing a 12.5 mix, the thickness of my specimen can only be a half inch, which means I need an even larger pan than I needed before to be able to spread my mix out to this, to this condition. And I highly recommend when you end your short-term aging, which you've done the day before, you go ahead and spread this mix out into a larger pan so the next day when you go to do your long-term aging, these pans are right ready to go in the oven. Once my specimen has been long-term aged for eight hours, I, can br I need to bring it back up to compaction temperature prior to compacting. And I have a maximum of 75 minutes to accomplish this. It won't take nowhere near this long, but, but you do have that amount of time available. Again, we compact the pills are still the same size as 62 millimeters in height with the air void range of seven plus or minus 0.05. We talked about what happens if your voids are out already. So if, you, if your voids are out and you only made five pills, you don't have enough to report a long-term age test result. So I highly recommend for this test, which takes multiple days to complete, you do mix and, and prepare seven specimens at a time. Now let's move on into the rutting test, which is the APA test. Let's talk about uh, this test is required to be done at design asphalt content and 0.5% above. To do this test, you need a minimum of four gyratory specimens per test, and the specimen size is 150 millimeters in diameter, 75 millimeters in height. Just like before, you have a specified air void range of seven plus or minus 0.05. So it might benefit yourself, instead of making a minimum of four gyratory specimens, to go ahead and make six. You can always pick the best four when it comes time to run your test. Uh, the conditioning of this sample is to condition your loose mixture for two hours at compaction temperature before compacting, which is just the same as we do with our volumetric specimens. It does still require that at 60 minute interval, which will mean at the one hour mark, halfway through, we need to, mix, we need to stir the sample up and mix it to make sure we have maintain uniform conditioning. And it's always important, I think, that you compact to speci specified height. After the rutting, we'll talk about the Canabro, the durability test. For the Canabro, uh, this test is, is actually done on our volumetric specimens. And it's required that it be done at design binder content and 0.5% below as design asphalt content. This test requires that a minimum of three gyratory specimens per test. Uh, and one thing that I have seen, the biggest error I've seen in this test so far, has been people are not getting the water. If, I mean, we had to measure the voids, right? And here I am, this is basically a, a dry weight minus a weight loss after the Canabro test. Well, if I leave water in my specimens, that becomes weight loss. So it's important we dry these pills back properly prior to running this test. But you'll hear more about this in other presentations. Specimen size is 150 millimeters by 115 uh, millimeters of height. It's our same volumetric pill. Uh, condition a loose mix for two hours at compaction temperature before compacting. Again, don't forget to stir at the one hour interval. Uh, when it comes to compacting to end gyrations, or end design, that is 50 gyrations right currently in Virginia. When we're compacting our lab mix specimens, you want to place the mixture in a mold in one lift. This is important. We don't want to segregate the mix after we've done all this work loading it into the mold, which will impact our void content. So you want to load it in one lift. Um, again, I, I, I've stressed this a lot, but I hear a lot of people trying to target a number of gyrations, and we'll talk more about this, but we recommend you do it. You change your, your gyratory to a height mode, and you compact to a specified height. Always, always allow the volumetric and BMD specimens to cool prior to measuring air voids or performing any test. Now let's talk about some production samples and what we got to do to make production uh, BMD specimens. 
First, let's talk about the number of BMD specimens you need. Um, th this table is going to put it into uh, a, a comparison per lot. If you're doing a 4,000 ton lot, a standard lot in Virginia, we have to do volumetrics once per thousand tons. So I need a minimum 12 volumetric pills, okay? The IDTCT, the crack test, requires a test to be done every 2,000 tons. So, and we've already talked about that the IDTCT takes five specimens to average in order to get the uh, 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 one CT index value. So I need a minimum of 10 specimens, but again, I would recommend you, when you're making your individual specimens for testing, instead of only making five, you make seven, so I have one or two to discard if my voids are out of range. The Canterbro uh, is not any extra testing specimens here, it's just a matter of running a test on your actual volumetric specimens. Now, currently, VDOT require, requires the producer, the contractor, to make all their specimens. Um, when, that, when you add that in, right now VDOT wants you to make a set of specimens, which is IDTCT at 4,000 tons, so one per lot. Um, so that means you got to have an additional five specimens on top of the 10 above that was made for the producer to test. You got to add five for the DOT to test. And then just like before, you probably need to make a few extra to make sure the void you give the VDOT or within the acceptable range. Likewise with the Canabro, this will be an additional set of uh, volumetric pills, so it won't, for one of your samples, it, probably a Canabro you're gonna run, you'll have to make six volumetric pills for this. So when you count this out, you have a minimum of 30 specimens required for per lot of production testing. In addition to, to this, but not in every lot, only once per project, you have to uh, make specimens for the rut test. But this is only once basically per project per year. Well, yeah, it could be more than, one, per, more than once per year if you've got multiple projects, multiple contracts. But once per contract, per project, you need to make four specimens uh, and to get the rut test done. So th the numbers you're ta seeing in this table are the minimum we'll be required to run per lot. It's possible you could have to do quite a bit more. And if you notice the note below, which I will just read straight off of the uh, screen, if less than 300 tons of a JMF, job mix formula, is produced in a day, field soupave testing, which is volumetrics, and performance testing will not be required that day. Well, that's good. That day's tonnage shall be added to subsequent production when the accumulated, accumulated tonnage exceeds 300 tons minimum testing frequency shall apply. Well, what happens if you're not doing 1,000 tons every two days? You're only doing 300 one day and 300 the next. That's 600 tons. Combined, you're over the 300 ton limit, so you've got to do this testing that's stated above. And this can add, if you do smaller quantity production versus 1,000 ton days, you could end up with a higher frequency of, of testing than what you have stated above. So there is, with production testing, there is quite a bit of it. One thing in addition to all these samples we've re mentioned to you above, during the BMD class, you're gonna hear about the ideal RT, RT rut, rutting test, okay? We, you may not have heard it prior to this, but you will hear it more, discussed more during this class. And I would highly recommend, while you're making all these other specimens on a sample, you also make five specimens for the ideal RT test that you can get this test accomplished. Proper sampling is key to field production, uh, to your field production testing. Uh, in the past, prior to BMD, you know, we would take a volumetric sample or furnace burn, uh, uh, we would take a sample that's furnace burning gradation and or a volumetric sample. Well again, we talked about a volumetric sample is only three pills per test, per, per time we're testing. You saw in the previous table how much is required in thousand ton increments to be done now. Well, when it comes time to obtain a sample, whether it be volumetric or volumetric and BMD, you gotta obtain a representative sample according to VTM 48. VTM 48 requires that you, you level off the top of your load of asphalt which, as you can see done here in the first picture. Well, 
once I start taking a couple scoops for my volumetric sample, I'm very quickly going to have covered this entire surface and I haven't even begun sampling my BMD specimens yet. So it's, it's probably, most likely, that you will be have to, when you're taking samples uh, for BMD testing, that you're going to have to strike this load off more than once. So once you've covered your surface area there, be prepared to strike off six more inches and then take the remainder of your sample. Option two, and I've seen uh, producers do this, is to dump a couple tons on the ground, sample right out of those couple tons that have been leveled off, as you can see in this image, and then you just have the loader operator put this, this, these few tons in your wrap pile so they get recycled and you don't lose anything. We talked about how large these samples need to be. Well, it's very important that these larger samples get properly split. A couple ways of doing that, as you can see in the first picture here, is a quartering method. As long as you follow proper quartering procedures, you can quarter each bag or each pan as you do it and take opposite corners and put half in VDOT's bag, half in yours, and so on and so on. Uh, another option is this uh, piece of equipment here, this blue piece of equipment. It's called the Quartermaster. It'll hold three or four bags at one time and allow you to just flip the lever and do this split process really, really quickly. Now, uh, here's a, a quick video of reducing a sample down to specimen size. Today, we're going to talk about how you would obtain a representative sample for balanced mix design testing during the production mode uh, while your plant is producing material. Okay? Um, to do that, you need to obtain, first obtain your sample. This sample we have today is in a bag. You may have yours in a large pan. That's perfectly fine. Uh, ours is in a bag because we're not at a production facility. So we had to find a way to get it here. Um, to start with, before I place my sample here on my counter, I want to apply what I call a lab truck release agent, PAM. We just want to put a light coat of PAM spray on here and on our split knife as well. Just take an old rag. I don't want to leave excess on here. I'm just wiping off the excess is all I'm doing. Nice gentle wipe. There we go. Now, my representative sample I take in from the back of my truck. I'm going to dump it out on my counter, on my splitting table or countertop, whichever you have available. Now, before I do any splitting, I need to remix this sample. This is the only time you're allowed to use a, a scoop, but it does need to be a flat bottom scoop. Some people can scoop this up and apply it to the top and you can do this over and over and over. It's not my choice because it takes a lot longer and I'm taking a lot more scoops. The way I like to do it is with a large piece of metal. This way I can roll up large quantities at one time and roll it over and over and over. This needs to be done to make sure everything is mixed well and I have what's called a homogeneous looking sample. So I'll do this a few times. Okay, now I've got what I call a conjugal, I need to say the word, conjugal pile. You press it down in the center, level it out a little bit. Okay, here we go. Now, first thing I'm going to do is split it in half. Take my blade, split it in half real well, okay? Next thing I want to do is quarter this. Make sure I got this far enough apart that it won't affect things, okay? 90 degrees, doing separate quarters here. All right, now, next thing I'm going to do is I already know from my ideal CT samples or IDCT sample that I need 2,455 grams. That's my starting weight. This weight came from my mix design pills that were done previously. So I'm going to duplicate this weight to start with. So what I'm doing is I'm going to tear off my pan, zero, take the pan. Now, 
I notice no, we're not scooping while we're doing any of this. What I want to do is cut this, this quarter into another half, basically, which becomes an eighth of the peel. And I want to place this in my pan. See how much weight I got. I'm still off by 1,000 grams. So I'm going to come back and take another slice out of this same quarter, add that to my pan. Need about 300 more grams. Again, slicing all the way through my, my sample here, I'm going to add this much more. Wow, still off by 40 or 50 grams. So I'm going to get a little bit more here. All right, the target weight for this sample was 2,455 grams. Right now I'm at 2,455.3. Now that I've got my target weight, I'm gonna put this specimen in back in my oven to keep it warm while I'm splitting out additional specimens. Now, split out an, a second specimen. Tear off this pan, very close to the same weight, but a little different. Um, if you remember, this, this quadrant is where I got my previous sample. So I'm not gonna use this little bit of material. I'm gonna move it out of the way, I'm not gonna throw it away, but I wanna get a representative sample, so I'm coming to a different quadrant. It can be this one, or diagonal, I can use any one of the other three quadrants to try to obtain my, another IDT sample or specimen that needs to be 2,455 grams. So I'm gonna take this one, put it in. Let's see how I did this time. Eh, off by 100 grams. Okay. Twenty-four fifty-four. I'm within a gram. We're going to stop right there. Again, I'm going to put this one in the oven. And I should be able to easily obtain two more specimens out of this bag. But for now, so that you don't have to watch me split down more samples, we're going to stop here. Um, once I have removed these into other samples, into other specimens, I will keep this extra material in case I need to add 10 or 15 grams to any one of the specimens going forward. We just saw how the properly split out or separate down to specimen weights, but how do I know what the correct specimen weight is? Uh, where, where do I know when I'm in field production which weight to use for my, for my IDT CT specimen? Well, there's two options that are recommended. Option one is to start with the same specimen weight established during your mix design, or if it's your second or third production sample and you've already made an adjustment, you may be using the, sample, uh, the same weight you had in a previous sample. We gotta have a starting point. So that's the best starting point that most people seem to use is what they've done previously. Um, it, uh, what you wanna do at this time is make like two pills real quick, cool it down as fast as you can. When it comes down to this quick cooling, I've seen people use everything from fans and they're suspending their sample above the, the, the tabletop so that air is flowing underneath it, so it's basically flowing all the way around the sample. Or I've seen people actually put in portable air conditioners in their lab and blow air conditioned air across this sample to cool it off quickly. So any of this will work, but you want to be able to measure air voids as quick as possible so that you can split out the remainder of your testing samples or specimens. Um, this, this will allow you, as it says here, to adjust the weight as needed depending on the, the void range you, you achieve. Another option is uh, to measure the rice for each sample uh, and, and be able to calculate it. There's a spreadsheet available. It's a standard Excel spreadsheet that's available that has formulas in it that'll uh, calculate you a target weight that should give you the range, void range you were looking for for each test procedure. 
Um, with that being said, this, this Excel spreadsheet, if you contact myself, I'll be happy to send it to you. Uh, it was designed by NCAT, um, or you can reach out to your local DOT uh, district lab and they should be able to supply it to you as well. Um, there is an offset or correction factor that you may have to adjust in this spreadsheet depending on your mix specific that you'll also do over a couple samples. What I recommend is initially you do both options. You start with the weight that you had during your mix design and you run your rice and compare those two weights to see how close they are. From that you may even average the two weights, you may go with just one weight or the other. It sort of becomes a little bit of personal experience. Let's talk about the IDT CT plant specimens. Uh, we've already mentioned that it takes a minimum of five specimens per test. Uh, just as we did, talked about in the mix design, we highly recommend when you're making these, you make a couple extra in case your voids are out of range. Uh, the void range is still seven plus or minus a half percent, 0.5. Specimen size is the same, 150 millimeters 60 by 62 millimeters in height. And as far as conditioning, like what we did during the design phase, there is no conditioning. We want to bring these samples to compaction temperature as quick as possible and compact to that specified height. APA rut samples are for, for plant produced samples. We talked about you're going to need a minimum of four gyratory pills. Uh, just like before, you got a narrow range for air voids. That's seven plus or minus 0.5, so you might want to make a couple extra. Uh, specimen size is the same, 150 millimeters by 75 in height. And just like the IDT CTs, there's no conditioning required. As soon as you reach compaction temperature, you want to compact these specimens. The Canabro. The Canabro is your actual volumetric pills. So these are treated the same as we've been doing all our volumetrics previously. Um, specimen size is 150 millimeters by 15 mil 115 millimeters in height no conditioning and you want to compact them to end design gyrations which for uh, surface mixes now in Virginia is 50 gyrations. So let's talk a little bit more about how to handle the plant produced specimen sizes once you've calculated that size and you know that we're splitting them down and not scooping to obtain these samples. You want to divide the sample into individual specimen sizes. Now there was a specific pan size required and when we were doing our design phase, but when it comes to plant produced samples, we can get by with any size pan we want to. Uh, this bucket you see on the right here, I see a lot of labs use this bucket because it's round and it's very convenient to be able to dump the sample into my mold for compacting. Whether I'm putting a volumetric specimen in it as you see it here, or about half this much weight, which would be a uh, IDT CT specimen, this bucket will work for any of it. Um, just like we talked about before, these specimens, you have to split them down to the proper size as quick as possible, get them back in the ovens to be able to come up to compaction temperature and in individual sample sizes. Once that individual specimen has come to, compaction, to, the, to the compaction temperature, you're ready to go ahead and compact. No, none of the field mix needs any aging whatsoever. You're only trying to bring the specimen down that you split and, and, and quarter down or, or reduce down to the proper sample size to the compaction temperature and then compact it as quick as possible. Uh, just like before, you want to place the mixture in the mold in one lift and you want to compact the specimen to height or gyration. Gyration for volumetrics, height mode for your IDT CTs and your APA specimens. And here is a brief video on uh, She's going to show you about how to adjust your gyratory to the proper height mode and then to uh, compact a specimen. Once we have all our specimens in the oven and they're coming, continuing to heat up to the proper compaction temperature, we want to get our gyratory set up to make our IDT specimens. Typical production testing would be gyratory specimens, volumetric specimens. Those are normally compacted to 50 gyrations. When we're making our uh, IDT specimens, we, we recommend you change your gyratory settings to a height mode and set it to the target height of a pill, which is 62 millimeters. 
For this, I'm going to show you how to do it with this particular gyratory. But if you have a different model or a different manufacturer, you need to check with your, your supplier of your equipment to find out exactly how to do this. But for this particular brand, right now it's set for gyrations, 50 gyrations. I want to first change it to height mode. I do that by going down with this arrow till I come to compaction. It says right now gyration. I'm going to change this to height mode. It now says height. I hit enter or exit. And now I got to remember, oh, I went back to my home screen. On this home screen, I got to change my target. I'll do that by coming down to the height section and dropping it down to the target height of 62 millimeters. Take just a second. And then I hit enter. Now the, the gyratory compactor is set up to compact to it, how many of the gyrations it takes to get to 62 millimeters instead of a set number of gyrations. Okay, now once our specimens come up to temperature, we'll be ready to compact. So once we split out our specimens and they're in the oven, uh, and our molds in the oven, we're ready to compact our specimen, first thing we gotta do is load the mold. But one thing I forgot to mention previously, we are required by specification to make it a minimum of five IDT pills. I recommend when you're splitting out your specimens that you split out seven because indubitably you'll have one or two that'll be outside the acceptance void range and that'll give you something to discard and you still have enough pills made so that you, you can continue with your testing. So with that being said, let me move forward and load the gyratory mold. gyratory put my paper disc on in it got my specimen and my funnel all right now to load my specimen into my gyratory mold just drop it in in one lift. Like so. Take the funnel off. You're supposed to level your specimen out. No compaction. All we're doing is leveling it off, nice and gentle. Add a second paper disc to the top. Take my mold and my specimen over to the gyratory compactor. Load it in. Lock it down. Shut the door. Put the top on. Lock it in place. And the hard part comes now. Press start. Now, as I stated earlier, this gyratory specimen, or this IDT specimen, will be compacted to a target height, not to a target gyration. As you can see, compaction is complete. It compacted to a height of 62 millimeters, which took 37 gyrations. So now we want to remove the top and extract our specimen. Since these specimens are targeted 7% air voids, I typically will carry them with the base plate under them, so because they're more fragile than a 
a normal volumetric specimen compacted to a tighter density. It doesn't matter which specimen you're producing for um, plant produce, whether it be a volumetric or whether it be a BMD performance test. There's no aging required. We just want to bring each specimen up to compaction temperature and compact it as quick as possible. Thank you.